we started to draw the phasor diagram for this system. So we said, okay, we're going to start, I'm not sure what they call this, they call it E2 here, right? I think they call it E2, right? And what do they call here? Can, can you check your notes to see what, what they call here? And this might be one. Just add this one. Put this one I am, I see. I am, I see, uh, let me see what I call that first. Uh, IE. I'll tell you what they stand for. IE. Just to add, there is this tree. IE, they call it the excitation curve. E stands for excitation. I am is the magnetization curve. So the current is going through the X and magnifies the core. And I see is the, uh, the, is the current is showing the core loss. Remember, this is RC represents the core loss, right? Now let's go back to the phasor diagram to see how we can do. I want to go from here to here. That's my, my, my goal. I want to start from secondary, go all the way to the right. And I see you. Assume uh, V2 is the one we have it with as a reference. <coughs> and I2 is lagging respect to the voltage, <coughs> right? Now, uh, so we did this part yesterday, uh, Tuesday. Let me just make sure I have the right thing. This one was V2, I'm going to, I'm going to put the name down later. Uh, this is the V2, right? This one was I2, and it said here, if you write a KVL here, E2 is going to be V2 plus uh, R2, I2 plus uh, J, X2, I2. Maybe I call it X2. Which one you know, which one you put, you know. That's the uh, leakage inductance, if you remember. So we derive this one, we said okay, you should draw a vector parallel with this one, another one perpendicular to this one, and this one is going to be E2. Now let me let me let me explain it. This is the E2 and, and this is the J uh, X2 I2. And this is the <coughs> R2, I2, and this is the V2. Can somebody tell me what is this angle? <coughs> and you know this one is P, and this is the I2. What is this angle here? What is this angle? P, exactly. Now, let's go to the second one. We did this one. Uh, I have learned this voltage. How much is it in prime 2? You know, in prime 2 over E2, in prime 2, which is the E1, right? It's equal to N1 over N2. So basically, E prime 2 or E1 is equal to N1 over N2 E1. Just assume, assume. N1 over yeah. N2 is more than 1. Because this is a ground state right? For example, N1 is 2 turn, N2 is 1 turn. N1 is 20 turn, N2 is 10 turn, right? Because I'm assuming this one, it could be less. <coughs> now, basically, what if E prime is prime 2 or E1? It's going to be whatever is E1, right? times by a coefficient, right? And I assume this coefficient is more than 1. What does it mean? For example, if n1 over n2 is 1.5, for example, right? How much is uh, e1 or e prime 2? 1.5 <coughs> times e2. If I'm going to plot the down here, it's going to be like this. Right? Uh, yep. On that e prime 2 equation,
it says E1 over E2 is not A1 over E2, right? Yeah. That's the equation you have for transform, right? Ideal transform. Okay. Now, I'm going to call it E1. I'm going to write it E1. So E1 is this. Is that here? Right? E1 is the same direction as E2, just bigger, right? Because the ratio I had here was more than one. Now, let's look at this current here. I1, I1 is equal to IE plus I prime, two, right? I1 is equal to I excitation plus I prime. Two. How much is I prime two? How much is I prime two? Is the N2 over N1 I2, <coughs> right? This is the I prime 2, is N2 over N1 I2, right? And you said N1 over N2 is more than 1, right? So basically, I prime 2 is the same duration as I2, a little bit smaller, right? So if I'm going to plot the I2, I prime 2, this is I prime 2. Is it correct? This is smaller, right? The same direction, just a smaller. Uh, shouldn't we have I2 going into the transformer over its own? Uh, as I say, it really doesn't matter. You know, this is the right direction because power comes from one side, goes up from the other side. But if you want to put it this way, also it's fine. You are going to get a negative number. That's it. This is the standard way you know to draw. Now, uh, so. How I got the I prime, I prime 2? I said I prime 2 is N2 over N1 I2. Here I assume N1 over N2 is more than 1. So basically N2 over N1 is less than 1, right? So I2, I uh, prime 2 is going to be, for example, 0.5 times I2, right? If this is a I2, this is a I prime, right? Keep this one. Now, how about I N? I n is going to be E1 over J x n, right? And I c is going to be E1 over R c, right? Correct? I don't have a space here to write anymore. So, what about I C? I C. How about I E? I E is equal to I C plus I E, right? Uh, I I what is it? I S. Right. These two currents, they are 90 degrees far from each other. Why? For example, if I C is one with a zero angle, I M is one with minus nine. What? Oh, the two of them together have to be opposite of one another. Think about it here. Both of them, they, this one and this one, both of them, they see the same voltage, right? So, what's the angle of this current? The same thing as the angle of this voltage, right? What was the angle of this current? Now you need to keep behind this, right? So basically, if you draw the this two here, it's going to be like this. If this is the IC, this is IM. And this is the ID. They call this one phi no loop or phi open circuit. This angle they call, keep in mind because we are going to use this one later when we are going to do the transformer test I need this one. Phi no loop. It, this is, that one is different from this. They are very different. This one is usually very close to 80 degree, 85 degree, something like that. 
basically, if you look at I n, usually is much, much bigger than I c. Just let me put it here. I draw it really bad here. If you're going to do this, if you're going to do it here, it's going to be like I c here. And if you're going to be realistic, it's going to be like this. You don't have to worry. It's not just what I'm saying. If you're going to be realistic, it's like this. They call this one phi no load and this is a phi. Magnetization current and core loss component, right? Magnetization component of the current and core loss component of the current. Now, so to calculate I1, right? To calculate I1, I, I, I prime to I know how much it is, right? I can see it on the phaser diagram. I need to calculate I2, right? To calculate IE, I need to find the IC and IM, right? Let's find out those ones. So, this is the E1, right? So, I need to be small, but this is the IC, is it correct? E1 and IC, they are in the same direction, right? Right or not? <coughs> How about the uh, I N? Usually these two they are much smaller than this one. Two much smaller than this one. Let me make this one a little bit more here. Right? 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 I 
one by one. Right? J is one by one. You're going to be perpendicular to this one. What is this? This is a complete paper diagram. Don't worry about it, you know. Just, this is a very simple thing. It's just a KVL. The KVL is KCL. All of these diagrams are the KVL and KCL, nothing else. <coughs> now, next. We're going to get to the easy part. We're going to start to ignore some of these things, you know, to make it easy. I1, this is the IE, IN, IC, RC, XN, R1, X1, R2, R prime 2, X prime 2, V2, prime 2, I prime 2. Much, much easier to solve than that. Why? Why? Look at here, if here I need to calculate this IC and IN. I have to go calculate E1 first and come calculate this thing, right? But here, this two, they are going to be the same, right? Let's, let, me, let me write it big KVL here. 
I, I say the intention is to find the V1, right? If we have the V2, let's find the V1. V1 is going to be equal to R1 plus R prime 2, I prime 2, right? Plus J X1 plus X prime 2 plus
when you get to the distribution level and transmission line, okay. We don't even put this one in the model. The magnetization perhaps, we blow it. You know what I'm saying? So that's a very, very approximate, very simple simplified model of the transform. R X. V1, V prime 2. Right? If I get it of the we use this. This is for the next chapter. Get it of the R. Also. R is not that. <coughs> Forget it. Just X. The model transformer only with X. So don't get confused how the transformer only, only can be modeled with X. This is an approximate model. But it's pretty accurate for what we need for power system. More than 98% accurate. So for that two person, we are not going to kill ourselves to put all these elements here, make it very, very complicated for calculation and those kind of things. So this is the model we use for the for the power system modeling. We are going to use in the, I don't know, chapter three, four, something like that. Get there. This is the model we use for the transform. Sometimes they use this one if they want to be a little more accurate to show some, you know, uh, cover box. Any question here? It's clear, right? Yes, you know what to say. Right? Anyone? Anything, right? 
I1, I2, right? Right? So let's write, and this is the ideal transform, right? The part is not ideal, we put it here, right? So this is the transformer model, right? We went here, we said, okay, we can put an approximate model here, let's get rid of this part. This is the model we're going to be having for transformer, right? We, we, we ignore this part, right? So now, it's the ideal transformer, right? Basically, N1, I1 should be equal to N2, I2, right? Or I1 over I2, it should be equal to N2 over N1, right? If this current is zero, right? This is zero, right? And if this one should be zero or this one, which one is zero? I1. I1, N number of terms cannot be zero. We have some terms, something, one, two, three, five, whatever it is, right? So we call it no load. Is it clear? Yeah. Uh, so no load means that there is no current here. So there is no power. So we say, if we are under the no load condition, this voltage is equal to this one, right? Because it was one to one. Now, let's put a load there. Just I'm throwing some number out. Now we have a 10 amps current going here, right? Because this is one to one, we are going to have 10 amps current here also, right? So let's say the, the voltage drop here is 10 volt, for example. Just as I don't want to this number, 10 volt, right? So this voltage is going to be less than 100. For example, maybe 94, 95. Because they're phase -based. These are not, you know, just do subtracting from each other. But it's going to be something less than 100 volt here, right? For example, 94, right? It is 94 with a one-to-one. V2 is going to be how much? So V2, no load, 100. V2, we call it V2. If we don't call it, you know, full load or something. V2 is 94, right? If there was no load, you see 100 volt. If there is some load, you see less voltage, right? Because some, some of the voltage is going to drop on these easy right? It's a very simple case in case here, right? So, <coughs> for an ideal transformer, an ideal transformer, how much voltage drop do you have? If it's the ideal. Zero. But the transformers are not ideal, right? Maybe you have a very bad transformer. It dropped 60 volt over there. The one I said 10. So how much are you going to see now? Maybe 40 volt, right? This is really bad. If you look at the distribution system, I'm not sure how many of you have to look at it. There is a transformer because they don't bring 480 volts or 208, you know, to the to the to the city. A big voltage comes here, there is a step down transformer, they bring down the voltage down. Now, see, they show it like this. <coughs> they show it like this, very simple. This is a single line diagram, they call it single line diagram. Now this one is going to come here, go to this house, connect to that house, another house here. So all the way here, for example, just I'm making it very simple. Let's uh, think about a, a single phase transformer, right? You have 110 volt here when nobody is using power, right? Now, as soon as you connect this switch, the, the load, they're going to start to use power, right? So there's just some current going here, right? If this transformer is bad transformer, let's say it's a bad transformer, suddenly you see 80 volt here. It drops, right? Some of it drops internally on the transformer, right? You put 100 volt, 110 here, well, because this transformer is bad, it drops like 230, 300, sorry, 20, 30 volts through internal drop. What you haven't seen the output? 90 volts. What's the problem with 90 volts? You are happy with 90 volts? No, we can't power anything. Huh? It doesn't work. Everything's it doesn't work. When you can burn your, for example, your electrical equipment, you know, if you look at all the electrical equipment, they say plus minus 5%, plus minus 10%. He said this is a 110 volt, but it can work with it, not exactly 110. 110 is perfect. But it can work, for example, plus minus 10%. Let's make the easy calculation to be easy. So plus minus 10% of 100, 110 volts is almost 10. So it can work with 120 volt, it can work with 100 volt, right? Any voltage between 100 to 120 volt is good. It's good for this, uh, for example, I don't know, mix or whatever you want, right? But if the voltage goes less than that, 
will cause problems for the future. So a bad transformer will cause that problem. And there's another element here. There's a cable also, right? The cables, they have a impedance. I didn't put that one here. But now we're talking about transformers just I'm talking about transformer voltage drop. The other to show how good is a transformer, they define a new parameter. They call it voltage regulation. Voltage regulation is when they, OK, if there is no load, I have VNS. If I, they define it for full load, usually. You know, what is the maximum load I'm going to have here? One kilowatt, right? How much is this V2 at the worst case? Because that if my load is less than that, so the voltage drop is going to be smaller, right? The less power, the less voltage drop, right? If I have a zero power, there's no voltage drop, right? So they define a new parameter. They call it voltage regulation. It's going to be V known. I'm putting this one absolute value because this guy, they have a Angle, you know, we'll, we'll, calculate, we'll see this one in the angle. I don't care about the angle, how much is the angle. Just the magnitude, the amplitude is important for me. Minus. I call it V2. V, let's put V. Divided by V times <coughs> 100%. Is the definite define our equation of uh, voltage regulation. Now, let's go for this example like we can, right? How much is the VR? 100 minus 94 over 94 is going to be 6 over 94 is almost 6%. <coughs> More than 6%, but it's almost 6%, right? He said, what? Plus minus 10%, right? So if I tell you I have a transformer, its voltage regulation is 30%. Is this one good or bad? What is the voltage regulation for an ideal transformer? Zero. How much is the voltage regulation for an ideal transformer? Zero. 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 Why? Because these two, they are the same, right? These two, they are the same. They, so basically, it's going to be zero. If you have a load or you don't have a load, V is going to be the same, right? So this is the definition of voltage regulation. Now, I'm going to talk about efficiency of the transformer. But before talking about efficiency of transformer, I need to go back to explain the core laws. I'm going to do very quickly over the, uh, over the um, core laws, what is it, how we can calculate it. And you see some problem in the homeworks. In practice, it, you get better with those kind of things. But before we start the efficiency of a transformer, everybody knows what's the definition of efficiency? Output power, right? Divided by output power plus loss, or divided by P, right? Input. Output divided by input is the efficiency, right? So, and the input power usually is out, not usually, always is the output power plus power loss, right? So I want to see what is the power loss in the transformer. If you can recall, I said there are two types of loss in transformers. One is the copper loss. Copper loss is because of this resistor, right? The winding, they have a resistor, right? Every winding has a resistor. So we are going to get some copper loss because of that resistor. So this is one part. The second part is the core loss. So let's see how we can calculate the core loss for a magnetic core. I'm going to explain it for a magnetic core and the transformer is a magnetic core. You can use it for that. So core loss calculation. So you got the voltage regulation. This is very important for a transformer. The less, <coughs> the better, right? The less, the smaller, the better. The transformer is the more closer to the ideal transformer. Let me ask you this question, you know. Because you are an electrical engineer, maybe you go one day for interview, they ask you a very, very basic question, but maybe you have not heard it before. What is the ideal, if I'm going to draw the voltage versus current of an ideal source? It could be DC or AC, doesn't matter. What is the 
characteristic, how, what, how should I plot that one? Voltage versus current. Every, every store has a characteristic. How much is the output voltage versus how much current we are getting. So, for an ideal source, does this voltage change based on whatever load I'm taking here? No. Basically, it's going to be like this. Right? Whatever current you want to take, I'll um, I'm 100 right? I'm not going to change. But, let's make this one DC. But, if I have a real source, like a battery, right? Battery is a real DC source. Every battery, Have the internal resistance, right? If you look at the characteristic of the battery, it's going to be like this. Let's say this is a B. This one is B. Basically, when you start to get the low, right, this voltage is called this one. And this is B. I call this one. So the more you get current, the more drop voltage you're going to have here, right? So this voltage is going to reduce, right? So now, this is a characteristic of a real source, right? Let's say this is a full load. They call it high full load, right? Usually they define how much the voltage of this battery, for example, changes for this source. They say 3%, 4%. If they have a source, the delta V or the, the volt again is the voltage regulation. You can define voltage regulation. If the delta V is one percent, is it a good source or not? One percent is really good, you know. If you go to the full load, the voltage is going to change only one percent. It was hundred volt. You have a voltmeter here. You are measuring the voltage. You say, okay, okay, there is no load, and I see hundred volt. Now I connect a big load here, for example, hundred amps. That's a full load. Oh, wow. this is really good. Yeah. They call it a stiff source, a stiff DC box, or a stiff source, you know, because it could be DC or AC. But if I have a source, its voltage regulation is 20%, means oh, when I didn't have any load, it's 80 volt. When I have that, is, when I have a load, it's going to be, sorry, when there is no load, it's 100 volt. When I have a load, it's going to be 80 volt, 20 volt drop. Some of the batteries, they're bad. You have seen this one in your, your life. As you have a battery, you see there is a 12 volt. As soon as you connect it to them, it goes down to 6 volt. You know what I'm saying? Because this is, a, this is a really bad battery, right? So if the battery is a good battery, when you, you, you connect the circuit, it's going to go from 12 maybe to 11.8, 11.7, something like that. So this is the definition of the ideal source. In power system, they call it infinite boss. In power system, they call this one infinite boss. Infinite boss is an ideal system. I have a boss. Boss bar is like a node in the system. But think about it. You're going to take million amps, right? So, million amps, think about it. You need something, you need a structure to pass million amps through that, right? So, that thing, they call it boss bar. You can connect the source, load, those things. They call it boss bar in this system. So, in power system, they call it infinite boss. <coughs> infinite boss means an ideal source. You can take whatever current you want from the system. The voltage is not going to change. But in reality, there is no infinite boss. When we get there, I'll show you some of the cycle line, single line diagram. For example, in uh, GA, about a month ago, we had a rain. Uh, about a month ago, something like that, we had a heavy rain. Uh, there is a, there is a, I told you about this 3D, D3D facility they generate, like, you know, I, don't know how many, I don't know how many Teslas, but they, really, they have a very big power supply, which they are connected to the, they are connected to the uh, grid. They go up to 6 mega. There was kind of, I don't know, rain problem, something like that, from, it was the uh, explosion, you know, and they, they everything gone. Now, we redesigned the thing, I did the calculation, I'm not a power system engineer, but I know this thing is right, you know, they're basic for power system. I did the calculation for them, I'll bring one slide to show you a real system, you know, how they show them, and how they calculate the, because when you are going to put the inductor in this system, you have to calculate lots of things. It should be able to hold on to the short circuit current, 
It should be able to handle the nom nominal current, those kind of things. I'll bring one of them. But I'm saying over there, I said there is no infinite cost. But every, every real source you can model it with an infinite cost, plus some infinite, right? Seven and infinite, you know, all, all of you know, you know the infinite search. This is like this. You say VT plus, if it's an AC, we call it VT. If it's DC, it's RT. This is an ideal source. This is a real source. Every real source, you can model it with an infinite source plus an infinite.
reduce the uh, eddy current flows in the core. Now, before going a little bit further, I want to find the relation between this flux and that voltage. We said E is equal to N D phi over D phi, right? And in this case is V, because there is no resistance, right? They are almost equal. If, for example, let I'm calculating for this case, I'm going to give it in the homework not sign paper. I'm going to give you another type of waveform. You guys will calculate it. If V is equal to, for example, Vm, I'm going to find it. I 
previous one, this one is then a 4.4. So V R M N by 4.44 N F C max or if you need a this one they use it for design of transform, you know, to select the cross section of the transformer frequency, VM, those kind of things. But and VM is a VM time here. This is the equation relation between the VRMS and VM. If you have a side view, you know how many terms you have, you know what is the frequency of the voltage, 50 Hz, 60 Hz, whatever it is, right? These are known. You know how much is the cross section of the core, right? For example, you have a donut core, right? And you know how much is the cross section. If you know the cross, the cross section, you know how many turns you have, you know what frequency you are using, you can, cal you can calculate how much is the B maximum. How much B maximum if I connect 100 volt here, 50 hertz, how much is going to be B maximum for this core? You can use this equation. So the assumption, keep in mind, because in the homework you're going to say, the assumption was the voltage is signed. I'm going to give you something like this, for example, in the homework. First of all, plot the plot the flux and find the relation between the uh, or V maximum and the uh, and uh, whatever. But this one, I assume the the voltage. I give the easy case myself. The voltage is sine wave, right? Now we figure out if we have a magnetic core. We know the dimension of the core, cross-section area, number of turns, what is the frequency, how we can calculate the VM, right? Why am I just emphasizing on VM? The VM will be used to calculate the core loss. So we know how to calculate the VM. Now, let's go back again to what I said in the beginning of the transformer uh, section. We said we have two types of materials. Linear and nonlinear material, right? If you remember, we said this is the B versus H. It could be like this, or it could be like this. This one could be plastic, wood, something like that. This one is could be a steel or something like that. But if you have a magnet, magnet, you know, thermal magnet, right? <laughs> this one starts from somewhere here. They call it resid residual flux density. If we have a magnetic material, the, for like this core we are using, if we draw the VH, let me. For magnetic material, unfortunately we cannot test this one in the lab, but I wish we could and we can see this one. But let's say put B here. And uh, H here. We are in the lab, we have a core, magnetic core here. We are connecting this one to a source. And this source is by here. I can change it. I can change it. From zero, I'm going up, right? Basically, basically, I can control my H. First time I start from here, I'll go like this. I didn't have any H, my B was zero, right? I start to increase the current, let's say it's a current source, you know? We are in the ideal life, let's say it's not the this current. I can control the current. One amp, two amp, three amp, four amp, I can go up, right? When, it, when the current goes up, remember this one we said, integral of HDL is N I, right? If I increase the current, H is gonna go up, right? This one, if you remember, it said HL, is N I, right? Or H is N I over L. N and L, they are fixed. N is the number of terms that L is the length of this magnetic path, right? So basically, if I increase current, I'm increasing H, right? So when my current was zero, I was here. I increase my current, my H is increasing, 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 until I get to what? <coughs> Saturation area, we talked about this one, right? At some point, if even you increase your age, you're not 
I see any more B, right? This one, you got here? We said you increase the edge, you know, you're going to see more B, more B. At some point, it's going to get saturated. You're not going to see any more B, right? Now, I went to this point. I can see, oh, there's no change anymore. I used to that one. I say, I'm going to, I'm going to reduce my uh, current. I start to reduce my current, which means I'm reducing my edge. If you start to do that one, if the material is a magnetic material, you are not going to come back to the same path. It's going to come back like this. It's going to go like this. Right? And if you continue, you are going to get to this point. You know what they call this point? They call it thorium point. You know, at this point, the magnetic uh, properties all or completely is gone. If you have a magnet, one way you know to demagnetize a magnet, since you were a kid, you know that. You can get a hammer, hit it, right? It's going to lose its magnetic property. The other way is to heat it up, right? If you heat up a magnet, it's going to lose it. The other way to reduce it, you can put another magnet opposite to this one. You know what I'm saying? This is the opposite magnet, see? You're creating edge in a different opposite direction. It's going to start to reduce the magnetic properties of the magnet. Now, let's continue. You know, we can go negative current, right? The current was going this way, I can set the current that way, right? So this one is going to go continue to get the saturation point in the third quarter, and in the third quarter, right? I said, oh, okay, here is the saturation. It's not changing anymore. So, okay, let's go back. You know, I'm going to go back to this. This one, again, is not going to come back on this path. It's going to go like this. And if you keep going, you get to the same thing. And it's going to go through this loop. They call this one hysteresis loop. They call this one hysteresis loop. I'm going to show you why this area is important for us. I'm going to show you why this area is important. So we figure out what's the, we know what's the eddy current and we know what's the hysteresis now. But let's see how these things are going to relate to the power loss, the hysteresis uh, loop. Right? If I so D E is going to be E D 
every one over 60 seconds, 60 or every one over 60 hertz, and running one one time this loop. How much am this waiting power over one second? Times 60, right? So D P H. If my frequency is 60 hertz, every second I'm going to do this loop 60 times, right? So how much power loss I have? 60 times this area times the volume of it. So this is the of loss. Take a look at that, right? I'm not sure how many of you have seen this one before, but this there is this loss of four loss.
copper. T copper is clear, right? R I S two. Whatever current I have to the power of two times R. And P core is P any current plus P is Celsius. How much is the efficiency? P out over P in times hundred. Or we can say. P out over P out plus P loss. P loss is the P core plus CC. I want to define one more equation and done. You know what I mean? One more paper. Because I don't want to leave this one for later. <coughs> this is an instantaneous efficiency of the transformer. For transformer, they define a daily efficiency. What is the daily efficiency? I'll give you an example and you will leave. You have a boss, it can carry 40 people, right? If the boss is, is in the university, is moving his student, right? If from, I don't know what time they start, let's say 6 a.m., 12 midnight. If all the time this boss is moving 40 students, for example, every station, five come down, five coming. Five get off, five get off, get off. Go to the next station, 10 get off, 10 coming. So all they did have four, four year students. This is full efficiency. We are using this work at its full efficiency, right? But usually it's not like that. <coughs> for example, the capacity is 40. This station we have 25. Next station we have 28. Next station we have, I don't know, 32. It's going to change, right? So for transformer, it's the same thing. This transformer is a 10 kilo, 10, 10 kV transformer. But the load connected to the transformer is going to change. We are, is, like, even right now, all the light, light loads they are on, lighting loads they are on, so the power is going to go off, right? It's kind of 3, three midnight, all the lights they are off, you know, I don't know, all the ACs they are off, the load is going to go down, right? We define the last thing, we call it daily efficiency. I'm going to show the example on this one, you know, uh, in the class next Tuesday. Daily efficiency, at the same is going to be <coughs> sigma t times h divided by pn times 24. Keep this equation because I'm going to uh, solve the example. I'll say one more time. What is th? Let's say this is a transformer loop. Here, 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 here. For example, two hour you have two kilos. Three hours, you have six kilos. I don't know. One hour, you have eight kilos, right? And this is over 24, right? Over 24 hours. So the, the, the capacity of this transformer was 10 kilowatts. So this transformer could have handled 10 kilowatts times 24, right? That was the full capacity of the transport. But we had this zigma p. Here I have two times, for example, two hours. I put it here. Two times two. Here I have, for example, six times three. Here I have eight times one. And this is the daily efficiency of the transport. We'll talk about it in the, uh, the next you know, discussion section. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>